Thank you, Bill. Good morning to everybody again. Great to see everybody. Really, really is. And again, just uh, what a wonderful gospel meeting we had last week. And it's wonderful for us to be back together this morning to continue to worship God and glorify Him and to be together as the Lord's people here at Sunny Slope. I wanted Royce to lead a particular song this morning that I thought would really feed into this particular lesson, <clears throat> either just before I got up to begin to deliver the lesson or else maybe for the uh, invitation song, but as new song books are edited and um, always some songs are added to them, some songs are deleted from them, and so that particular song, Walking Down Heaven's Road, is not in our book. So. I thought it would really be a good song, again, either to lead into the lesson or to be the invitation song. It's a great song, great song. Walking down heaven's road, got to lay down my heavy load. Sinner, won't you come and walk with me? Praise God, glory, hallelujah. I'm singing every day, got sun shining all the way. And that's a great song, talking about changing our lives and walking with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, following God actively in our lives. Well, that's the title of the lesson, Walking Down Heaven's Road. And when you think about how we observe things today around us, our present health-conscious culture, I want to read from Charles Dickens a, st a statement that is attributed to him. He said, the sum of the whole matter is this, walk to be happy, walk to be healthy. The best way to lengthen our days is to walk steadily and with a purpose. Again, Charles Dickens, one of the most famous authors of novels that we have seen in our country. Think about, think about walking today. If you're living in a neighborhood, probably in most of the neighborhoods around town, Certainly in hours, you can look out almost any time of any day and you can see people walking up and down the street. Sometimes they're walking their dog. I saw something the other day that I had not seen before, and maybe I've just been behind in the, the culture of walking your dog. But there was a lady walking down the street and her dog was in front of her. She had him on, on a long leash and that was tied to something or connected to something in a belt that she was wearing around her waist. And I looked and I thought, that dog's walking her, it's like what it looks like. You know, but maybe that's something to keep the dog under control. I don't know. Maybe it's been around a while. I've just never seen it before. But people are walking up and down, sometimes single, sometimes a couple, sometimes a family. And, and it's, it's great to see. Well, if you go to the doctor, if you have some kind of surgery, or maybe if you're, you're just experiencing some kind of health problem, but particularly after surgery, it's almost automatic that the surgeon is going to tell you, after the surgery, after you go home, I want you to start walking. That's going to be one of the instructions as far as therapy and recovering from the surgery is concerned. It's almost across the board, hands down, I want you to start walking. You need to start walking. If you're going through physical therapy, they're going to tell you, you need to get out and walk. Well, it's... it's part of our health conscious, but also recognizing that that is a very common, a very uh, easy to perform usually. I mean, you don't have to go by weights. You don't have to join a gym. You can just get out and start walking. Exercise yourself toward godliness. First Timothy chapter four, beginning with verse seven. The apostle Paul wrote this, reject profane and old wise fables and exercise yourself toward godliness. For bodily exercise profits a little. But godliness is profitable for all things, having promise of that which now is and of that which is to come. Now, Paul is not demeaning physical exercise, walking, you know, or any other kind of physical exercise. He's just trying to focus upon the more important exercise that we should undertake. We live in a very health conscious culture right now. Great deal of, of focus on developing a healthy body. We talk about diet all the time. I don't know how many diets are out there. I, I, was, I was, you know, I, I said at different times, you know, people go into diets. I don't know how many diets I, w I went through early in my life. And I'd lose, you know, 8 or 10 or 12 pounds, and then I'd gain it all back again. And sometimes people will go on a diet, and they'll, get, they'll lose a whole lot of weight, and then they'll gain back more than they had before they started on the diet. 
Nobody likes a diet, do they? Now, you like the results sometimes, but the idea of going on a diet, you don't like that. Do you know what the first three letters of diet say? <laughs> Maybe that's one of the reasons. I don't know. You know. But how much and what kinds of food should we eat? We're told we're bombarded continually with diets. Lifestyle, activities, what about stress levels, recreational pursuits, exercise, cardio, aerobics, running, weight training, and walking, and walking. Well, the basic principle is good because what we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning with verse 19, is that we're supposed to glorify God through our bodies, through, through the way we live our physical lives. Paul wrote, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God and you are not your own? For you are bought at a price. The price was Jesus' life on the cross. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's or which belong to God. And so Paul says we need to live in such a way that we, through our physical well-being, our physical lives, our bodies even, we need to glorify God in the way that we live. So we need to take care of ourselves, obviously, bottom line. But also we need to recognize that there is a greater focus, and that is to developing healthy Christianity or a healthy spiritual life. That's far more important than just focusing upon our physical health and safety and well-being. Remember what Paul wrote there in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. He did not demean physical exercise, but he said there is another exercise that is even more important and has greater effects because it has eternal effects. And he says that's godliness, spiritual exercise. It is profitable for all things, and it's not going to benefit us just while we're still alive in our physical bodies in this, in this world, but it also has effects for us and consequences and blessings in eternity, in eternal life in heaven. It's interesting, in Acts chapter 24 and verse 16, we read this, and herein do I exercise myself to always have a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. Now there's, there's a, a focus of mental exercise as well as putting what we know to be right into action physically. But it's from a spiritual perspective, a spiritual perspective. In Hebrews chapter 5, beginning with verse 12, the Hebrews writer wrote, For though by this time, and he's writing to Christians here, they've been Christians for a while, because he says by this time you ought to be teachers. But now you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. In other words, the very basic fundamentals of Christianity. He's saying you should have grown up more by now, spiritually. He goes on and he says, you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes of only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. Well, we feed babies milk, don't we? Their, their digestive systems cannot tolerate some of the, sound, uh, some of the solid food right off the bat. And so we, we nurture them along the way. We give them milk. We give them formula. We give them some of that really yucky looking uh, cereal that you mix up and it looks like you know wallpaper paste. Uh, but we give that to them until they can, until they can tolerate solid food. He, he goes on, so he says, he is a babe. So, but solid food belongs to those who are full age, that is, those who by reason of use, those by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Spiritual exercise growing stronger in our faith. I also want to read from Hebrews chapter 12, verses 11 through 13. And here again, now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, <clears throat> but painful. Nevertheless, afterward it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Now sometimes we realize I need to do some things, like a diet, if I am overweight and I need to lose weight, if I need to get more healthy, Maybe I just have not paid attention to moving as much, to walking as much, to being as active, and I need to build up some muscle tone, but I need to focus on that if that's what I need. 
But that's not always pleasant when we get started because we're doing something that's taxing our body in a way that we have not done before. So a little bit of pain to begin with, but then it turns into something good. Verse 12, therefore strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight the paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather healed. Now going back to verse 11, when it says uh, the, the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. The King James Version translates that particular word, those who have been exercised, exercised. And there's the thought again and the principle. And <clears throat> when we look at 2 Peter chapter 2, beginning with verse 14, we see a different focus of exercise that a whole lot of people are, are taking part in. And that's unrighteous exercise, or exercise, exercising in unrighteousness. In 2 Peter chapter 2, beginning with verse 14, having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin, they have a heart trained, the King James Version says, they have a heart exercised in covetous practices and are, acu are, are cursed children, for they have forsaken the right way and gone astray. There are a whole lot of people who are exercising toward ungodliness all the time. They're involved in all kinds of, of sinful, unrighteous, ungodly pursuits. In some cases, you might say wicked, evil even. They've, they're well exercised in ungodliness. But that's the opposite of what Paul says we need to focus in our spiritual lives to exercise unto godliness, to grow spiritually, to grow stronger in our faith. It, a popular, a popular exercise these days, as I said, is simply walking. Simply walking. Well, again, it's an easy thing to do for the most part, unless you know maybe you haven't done that for a while, or maybe you're recovering from a painful surgery. And and but ultimately, they say, look, you keep doing that, and it's going to get better and better. It's going to help you along the way, help you recover faster. So what I want to do, though, is get away from the physical exercise of walking, and I want to understand that principle and apply it to some spiritual walks that we need to take in getting to heaven. First, we need to think about, again, where is our focus? Jesus talked about in Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, two paths down which we have the choice of walking through this life. He said, the gate is straight and the way is narrow that leads to life and few there be who find it. But broad is the gate and wide is the way that leads to destruction and many there be who walk down that path or who are moving down that direction in life. So two pathways, we're walking through life. There's no third one in the middle. There's no four or five, fourth or fifth one on the periphery. It's either we're walking, we're living our life, we're moving toward heaven or we're moving toward hell. One or the other, that's it. Those are the only choices. Which one are we walking down today? Which one are you walking down today? Be honest with yourself now. God already knows the answer and there's no pulling the wool over his eyes. So which walk, which walk are you taking? Are you walking down heaven's road or are you walking down the pathway toward destruction? Well, let's look, about, look at some spiritual walks we need to take or spiritual focus in our walk through life. We need to walk in the light. 1 John chapter 1, beginning with verse 5. This is the message which we have heard from him, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and we walk in darkness, and that is, that is illustrative of sinfulness, ungodliness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Are we walking in the light? Are you walking in the light of God's word, his teachings, his will for your life? In Psalm 119, verse 105, the psalmist wrote, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Are you walking by the teachings of God's word? Are you walking in God's will, walking in the light of God's world, word? Proverbs 6 and verse 23, for the commandment is a lamp. 
God's commandment is being referred to there. God's way, his instructions, his word. And the law is a light. Reproofs of instruction are the way of life. God guides us in his word to walk in the light of his will. He communicates to us his will through his word. But that's not all. We also need to walk in truth. And in 2 John chapter 1 and verse 4, John the Apostle wrote, I rejoice greatly that I have found some of your children, he's talking to Christians there in a particular congregation or an area of the Lord's church, that I have found some of your children walking in truth as we have received commandment from the Father. And then in 3 John chapter 1, verse 4, I have no greater joy to hear than to hear that my children walk in truth. Walk in truth. How we need to walk in truth. What is that truth? It's God's word. In John 17, 17, Jesus prayed in the night of his betrayal, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. And Peter identified the word as truth also. And so as we're walking in the light of God's word, we're also walking in his truth. Now, that doesn't mean we just read it and we kind of shake our head. Huh, yeah, that's right. We have to live the life that is instructed, that is guided for us in that particular word. And we need to walk uprightly. Interesting word, isn't it? Now, sometimes some people say, yeah, well, walk upright, and they mean straighten up, you know. Put your chin up, you know, look ahead, you know, don't slump over while you're walking. But we're talking about something completely different in this way. From a spiritual perspective, the psalmist wrote in Psalm 84 and verse 11, for the Lord is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. Uprightly. Now, what does that mean? Psalm 25 and verse 21, let integrity and uprightness preserve me for I wait for you. He's talking about walking again faithfully in the teachings of God's word, in the ways of godliness. All of this really works together. And we need to walk humbly with our God, humbly with our God. A lot of people have a difficult time with humility, don't they? In fact, probably most of us at times, we find ourselves having difficulty with kind of just humbling ourselves in the given situation of that particular moment and simply being humble and doing what needs to be done in order to be pleasing to God and in order maybe in some cases to, to just kind of straighten things out, make sure everything's done correctly. In Micah chapter 6 and verse 8, he has shown you, O oh man, God has shown you, God has shown us what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to have love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. We must be willing to humble ourselves, even as Jesus put it as a little child in Matthew 18 and verse 4. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Now, he's not talking about becoming a little kid again and acting childishly as a grown adult, but he's talking about what that little child. We see how our little children, they can humble themselves so much. Daddy said such and such, so that's right. Mom said, you know, don't do this, so I, I, I'm not going to do that. Now, they, they may not understand all the ins and the outs of the reasoning behind those instructions, but they understand that's Daddy, that's Mama. And they're my parents, they're the authority figures in my life, and I will follow what they say. I will respect them. I'll think my dad can do absolutely anything. He could probably jump off a 100-foot cliff and, and glide through the air if he told me he could because they'd accept dad like that. Well, Jesus says we need to humble ourselves before God as little children in our physical lives humble themselves before their parents and before other people. In, in Luke chapter 14 and verse 11, whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. And that basic instruction, by the way, is repeated several times through the scriptures. I think it's a lesson that we're supposed to get, that's supposed to come across to us and make sense to us. So 
we need to walk humbly with our God. We also need to walk properly, properly. Now certainly this would fit in with walking by integrity and also walking in uprightness, but you see all of these really flow together. They're really complementary to one another. Let us walk properly. Romans 13 and verse 13, let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, and I'm sure a whole lot of other not ends could be added to that. And sometimes we need to recognize that I, I don't think I'm you know, necessarily not walking properly, but in the eyes of other people, it may come across that way. And so I need to just take care. In some cases, in some settings, I need to just kind of discipline myself a little bit more than I normally would. We need to walk, walk properly. What is proper? What is proper? Is it proper to you know, go to work in the morning you know, with your hair sticking all out and, and, you know, never having brushed your teeth and, and being disrespectful to all your co-workers and all of that, that's not proper. But we could look at all kinds of other examples along that line as well. But as Christians, we really need to walk properly. And so how is that, that we walk properly as Christians, properly before God? I think a basic text that kind of consolidates it down in, in teaching and meaning is found in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8. And here Paul says, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, what if, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. We need to catch ourselves sometimes before we speak and not say things that we should not be saying. We need to catch ourselves before we speak and think about the way we say some things that maybe need to be said. We need to walk properly before God. We need to conduct ourselves in proper way as Christians. Now, this is one that really... I guess if you wanted to summarize all of these in one particular walk, we need to walk worthy of our identity as a Christian. In Ephesians chapter one, 4 and verse 1, Paul wrote, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, and when he wrote this particular letter, this is called one of the prison epistles, when I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you are called. We wear the name Christian, we're wearing the name Christ. And as God the Son, we're wearing a name that identifies divinity. We, are, we have become one with Christ, baptized into him. Romans chapter 6 and verse 3. Galatians 3 and verse 20, 27, we have put him on as we were baptized into him. Put him on as we would wrap a garment around our body. We need to walk worthy of that name, as worthily, using an adverb, as we can in still being human form in this earth, on this earth. We need to walk worthy of our identity as a Christian. And we need to pay attention to that as well. And not just kind of, you know, put in the back of our mind, not paying proper attention, let problems develop because we were not walking properly in a given setting. Colossians 1 and verse 10, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. I need to continually ask myself, I need to continually ask myself, am I doing what God wants me to do? If I make this particular decision, is that going to be pleasing to God? Is that what God would want me to do? If I go in this particular direction, is that going to be walking worthy of the Lord? I found myself in a bar one night after work, going way back early in my life when I was working in the grocery industry. And I went in the bar and I, I went because my co-workers were there. And so after work, it was probably 9, 30, 10 o'clock at night, we went into the bar and we, we sat there and, and they were drinking alcoholic beverages and I sat there and I just 
listened and talked, and I did not have any, I might have had a Coke. And I thought, as long as I just don't do the deed, you know, I don't take the drag on the, on the, the, the marijuana cigarette, or I don't take, you know, a swallow of the alcohol, whatever it was, as long as I just don't do the deed, I, I can, I'm okay, I'm, I'm in that company. That bothered me so much, bothered me so much, that before too long a time, I repented publicly. I, I, I just want to make sure if I've done something wrong, I want that I want the church to know I, I've repented of that. Please pray for me. I wanted to make it right. I wanted to walk worthy of my Lord. I've never been in that kind of a setting again since. And I intend to never be in that kind of a setting again since. I don't ever want to put myself in some kind of setting that jeopardizes the view of others as to my identity as a Christian, a true Christian. So. Colossians 1 and verse 10, walk worthy of the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 12, that you would walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Into his own kingdom and glory. We need to be thoughtful. We really do. Now, we need to walk by faith. Obvious, familiar verse of scripture, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 7 for we walk by faith and not by sight, not by sight. And it's an interesting verse of scripture in Romans 14 and verse 23. He who doubts is condemned if he eats because he does not eat from faith. For whatever is not from faith is sin. If I'm involved in something that may jeopardize my faith or may cause me a problem with my faith, then I, 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 I just probably need to stay away from that. We need to walk by faith. And then finally, we need to walk and not faint. Now, the idea of fainting there is giving up, basically. We need to never give up, but always walk by faith in God and the, and the faith of God's word, by his instructions, by his teachings. Isaiah 40 and verse 31, again, another interesting verse but those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Have you ever taken a walk and you got so tired? You just were ready to fall out almost. Maybe you gave up and said, I can't walk anymore. Turned around and went back. Well, you just realized you just walked all that way. You walked there. You walked back yet. <laughs> I remember my son telling me one time he and, his, he and his wife did a lot of hiking, or at least they enjoyed hiking in the mountains of, of the Smoky Mountains. And so he and, him, he and she and her sister, they went on a pretty vigorous hike through one of the trails through the mountains. <clears throat> and it was so vigorous apparently that as they were coming back, they got only part way back and the girls just sat down and they were so worn out, they were so tired, they were crying, they were feeling so bad. And so he said, look, let's go back to camp because they were camping. Let's go back to camp, let's break camp, let's go rent a motel room and let's order some pizza. It was amazing the regenerative effect that those words had on those girls. They jumped up, they stopped crying, they started cheering, all right, let's go, you know, and they made it all the way back. Walk, do not faint. They shall walk and not faint. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 58, at the end of that incredible treatise on the resurrection, Paul said, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Oh my, these are Christian walks. But you put them all together and we could say this, these are the Christian walk. In order to walk your way to physical fitness, you've got to persevere. 
You gotta hang in there. You gotta keep doing it. You can't just walk every once in a while and hope to succeed. It must be an ongoing exercise. Exercise. Remember 1 Timothy chapter 4 and uh, verses 7 and 8 again. Exercise unto godliness. Now, the same thing is true when it comes to your spiritual walk. You must pay attention to what you're doing. You must persevere. You must not break the cycle or break the discipline. You must keep walking that spiritual walk, your Christian walk, every day. Every day. Walking down heaven's road is the most important walk you can take. You may not achieve some other endeavors that are rather consequential, in, inconsequential by comparison, but you need to walk down heaven's road every day. You need to keep that walk going. You need to keep that spiritual exercise in focus. It's the most important walk you can take. You need to be that faithful, dedicated Christian so that you can have the ultimate result of being in heaven with God and Christ and the Holy Spirit for all of eternity. That walk needs to be purposeful. It needs to be focused. Following God's guidance. Need to walk in the light. We need to walk in truth. We need to walk uprightly in integrity. We need to walk humbly with God. We need to walk properly. Following his teachings consistently. We need to walk worthy of our identity as a Christian. Christ died on that cross for that identity to be taken by us. We need to walk by faith, and we need to walk and never give up. Are you, are you truly walking down heaven's road? Are you walking the Christian walk, or do you need to get on the path, or maybe back on the path? Are you ready to study God's word, to learn more definitely what God wants you to do with your life, how to walk that Christian walk, that walk with God, we'd love to study with you if you'll just ask us. Are you ready to be baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins as two different ones were this past week? We'd love to help you with that if you'll just step forward or talk with us privately and let us know. Do you need to come back to the Lord? Or maybe do you just need to say, you know, I... I've been trying to be faithful, but I realize I've not been as diligent as I, I need to be. I've not been as focused as I need to be. If you'll let us know, we'll pray with you and for you. And you can do that publicly or we can do that privately. But if you need to come, let's be on God's pathway to eternal life. Let's walk down heaven's road as we stand and sing.